Good morning to all the participants, students. It is our Zoom session on GST about the emerging trends in GST. That means to say that all updates. It is a, you will be having, you know, all of you are lucky to have a speaker who is expert in this GST Act. GST practical procedures. I have, I have great pleasure in introducing CA Irshad. So his uh, brief profile, CA Muhammad Irshad Ahmad. He is BCom LLB FCA. He is a practicing fellow chartered accountant with over 17 years of post qualification experience. He exclusively deals in GST and related matters and is regularly engaged by large corporates, government authorities, public sector units, high net worth clients on tax consulting and litigation matters. He represents several clients before the tax authorities on various matters. And he is currently partnered with MIA and Associates Chartered Accountants Firm at Banjara Hills, Hyderabad. He worked for the international organization KPMG and has handled variety of clients, including multinational companies in different sectors, such as information technology, banking, large trading houses, etc., both in India and abroad. Uh, and he's also a member of Grievance the Digital Committee formed by Central and State GST Department Hyderabad, Telangana for the year 2022 and 23. And he's also a member of GST Committee of SIRC of ICA for the year 2022-23. He's also co-chairman of Indirect Access Committee of Federation of Telangana Chambers of Commerce and Industry, Hyderabad, Telangana. He's a founder member of Confederation of GST Professionals and Industries, Mumbai, a Pan-India Confederation of GST Professionals, Industries and Associations. And he is also a regular guest speaker on GST at various forms, trade associations, professional bodies, including ICI, FT, CCI, ASUCAM, ASCII, etc. on GST. He addressed several GST training sessions under certificate course for GST conducted by ICA across Telangana and Andhra Pradesh in 2017 to 18. And CA Irshad is also a law graduate and regularly gives several representations and suggestions from time to time government on critical matters on GST involving trade and economy. He is a guest faculty with uh, uh, Nassin uh, CBIC and uh, has addressed several GST officials on variety of topics. He is a member of IDT study group on indirect taxes formed by IDT committee of ICI in 2016 and 17. Member of a team which prepared the background material on GST by IDT committee. 2017, a popular GST reference material across various industry sectors, government departments, and professionals in India, which is, I know, with his uh, high expertise and knowledge on GST, we have a wonderful speaker. I request all the students, please mute your mics while listening to the speech and uh, interactive session will be at the end. Sir, now the floor is open for you, sir. Thank you, good day. Thank you so much, uh, Prakash Garu, and very good morning to all the participants. And uh, it's my privilege to participate in this important topic organized by uh, Institute of Practical Accountancy under the guidance and uh, 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 chairmanship of Mr. Uh, Prakash and uh, it's really an honor and i hope uh, i will justify the topic which was given to me uh, for today's session since uh, 
I'm a speaker on GST. I have an expertise on GST. We thought of uh, speaking on uh, or taking this topic on GST today. And that is what it is today now. So now uh, what I have done, my topic is divided into two components. Uh, one is the basics. And the second one is the latest uh, uh, trends. What, what is emerging? Like you might have seen so many things in media that is coming out. There is a GST on pulses. There is a GST on grains. There is a GST on curd, lassi, et cetera, and et cetera. So, uh, and then there are so many collections, GST collections, crossing one and a half crores, one and a half lakh crores, et cetera, and et cetera. So, uh, I will try to um, uh, touch upon these topics uh, uh, into my second part. But the first is first. Uh, we'll just go into the basics because I was told the members of audience are uh, uh, basically divided into two groups. They could be either freshers who are wanting to um, uh, go into the industry and wanting to have some basics in whatever they are uh, going to work on. So therefore, I thought of uh, speaking first on basics so that those participants who are new to the GST law, they can uh, benefit from these basics. And then second component, of course, people who already know GST, who, has, who are already doing working in GST, who know the basics, they can also benefit with what is going on in the GST. And of course, we have a Q&A session lined up uh, once this talk is over. Uh, whatever doubts you have in your mind, uh, small or big, doesn't matter. You can uh, raise your queries in the uh, chat box or mic would be open, whichever way. And uh, I will try to uh, respond, respond to your queries. So uh, let's now dive into topic, to, to today's topic. Now, uh, I won't take much time on uh, really, these are very basics. This goes back to five years earlier when the GST was introduced. Prior to GST, uh, you can see on the screen, there were so many taxes which were involved in uh, indirect taxes area. You can see on the screen, there's a, there was excise duty, there was service tax, sales tax, customs, uh, duty on certain components. Of course, you have custom duty on now, now also, but um, so, uh, certain items, uh, some of the uh, some of the entry entry number eighty three in list one schedule seven was eliminated, and there was entry tax or entertainment tax, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So this was the structure prior to the GST law. Now, when the GST came, so many taxes got subsumed, and one GST, one law across the nation has come into. Uh, the picture now and what we are witnessing today so it is no less a wonder because i can as you can see the problem with the uh, regime prior to gst was uh, there were uh, unique vat taxes across all states they had their own uh, tax structure own rates own policies own rules etc and etc across india there was no uniformity so therefore one if at all one big change that, G, that this GST has brought in is it has it has uh, um, created a uniform tax structure across all across uh, the entire India by subsuming all these uh, taxes. So if one can say what is the biggest benefit that the GST has given um, to the members of the industry or to the stakeholders is that it has brought in the uniformity across the country. It has brought in the uniformity. Uniformity in the tax rates, tax policy, rules, returns, etc. and etc. That is one of the biggest achievement of this uh, the law. Now, <clears throat> so um, one thing I would like to mention here and you should also keep into mind um, for alcohol is still out of GST. You might have heard in the newspapers um, alcohol uh, is administered by the state government and uh, they give the licenses and they charge the tax on that that is still outside the purview of the gst law so tobacco is within the purview of uh, the gst law now petroleum products so petroleum products it was supposed to be bought into gst within five years of uh, gst coming to the picture but now uh, it is possible that it could be deferred further so as of now Petroleum products such as petrol and diesel are outside the purview of GST, but within the law itself, there is a statement stating that this would be bought into the law. So if not now, but very soon, that may become part of the GST law. So alcohol, there is no discussion. It won't become part of the GST law, but petrol and diesel, of course, um, there is a possibility and it will happen in uh, future. As of now, it is not there, but it will happen in future. 
So now one another in, important distinction uh, with uh, between GST and the prayer uh, GST prayer indirect, indirect access laws were the state and central will have concurrent power to levy the tax. So earlier, for example, VAT was there, state sales tax. Sales tax center did not have power to levy the tax. Similarly, states did not have power to levy tax on excise. So now, say state and central both have the concurrent power to levy the tax. So this is one of the important achievement as well, because bringing together all these states across country and uh, convincing them to agree on this legislation and coming together and deciding on tax rates and tax policy is one of the biggest achievement in recent times. So what is Indian GST? Some of the basic concepts uh, um, are listed on the screen here. It is a destination-based dual taxation uh, uh, scheme. What is destination-based? So ultimately, ultimately, the goods or services where it is consumed, that place has to bear the burden of the tax. That is called as destination-based dual taxation, destination-based tax. For example, if I sell the goods from Telangana to Maharashtra, so who has to bear the tax burden in the GST law? So where the goods are landing, where the goods are consumed, goods are getting consumed in Maharashtra. So therefore, the consumers in Maharashtra, they have to bear the tax burden and not the, not the, uh, um, uh, not the state where the goods are origina originating, for example, Telangana. So earlier, for example, if I am selling the goods from state of uh, Telangana, then the sales tax revenue would have flown to the government of Telangana. But now, since the goods are moving from Telangana to Maharashtra, so the tax also moves from Telangana to Maharashtra. So the revenue, revenue generated would be collected by the government of Maharashtra and the burden will also be passed on to the consumers in Maharashtra. So therefore, so the destination-based dual taxation is one of the important feature of the GST system. Unlike uh, previous system where the origin, the place where they are originating, so that used to be the tax structure and that used to be the place where the revenues were, were collected. So it, it applies on all transactions of supply. There is a new concept in GST law, which is the supply. So whatever you supply, the GST will apply subject to exemptions. So supply has been defined. What is supply? I will try to explain you by comparing the supply with previous terms. We had manufacture in excise. We have services, provision of services in service tax. We have sales, the incidence of sales in VAT loss. Now sales is gone, manufacture is gone, provision of services is gone. Now what has come? The supply has replaced all these terms. The moment you supply anything, the moment you supply the goods, the moment you supply the services, the GST applies. The moment you, so the sale, the term sale has been replaced. In GST, we call it supply. We don't call it sales anymore. Anymore. In GST, the supply replaced manufacture. In excise, the incidence of tax was manufacture. So, so, those, so the supply has replaced the manufacture. We don't call manufacture, no. We call supply. The tax is only on supply. If I manufacture the goods and store in Godown, there won't be a tax now. The moment I move the goods for sale or supply, the tax applies. That is the difference. So there are two components into the GST law. One is central goods and service tax. You might have seen on invoices also, you will see CGST and SGST. So CGST is central goods and services tax, SGST is state goods and services tax. And these have to be paid separately. <clears throat> so ITEC is input tax credit. I will explain you what is into input tax credit in subsequent slides as well for um, uh, members who don't know about what is ITC. So now the important thing is CGST credit. There is a credit of central goods and services tax. It is as a adjusted against CGST payable and SGST credit is adjusted against SGST payable. This is very important, my friends. This is also one of the fundamental concepts of the GST. So CGST cannot be adjusted with SGST and SGST cannot be adjusted with CGST. <clears throat> so uh, another, some of the other uh, important features of the GST law, uh, there is a uniform procedure for collection of taxes. Across all India, there is a uniform procedure for collecting the taxes and it is administered both by the central and the state governments. Now, another important thing is what is exemption limit? Exemption limit, like if someone asks you the question, 
what is the threshold when do i have to register in the gst your answer should be if you cross 20 lakhs turnover per annum then you have to register into the gst so 10 lakhs is applicable for northeastern states some of the states they have been listed it in the law itself so 20 lakhs is applicable general limit and 10 lakhs for the smaller states now one important point here is in telangana the limit is 20 lakhs and 10 lakhs, whereas outside Telangana, for rest of the other states, they have increased the limit to 40 lakhs. So it is not 20 lakhs for them, but it is 40 lakhs in respect of goods. But in respect of services, that continues to be the 20 lakhs. But for Telangana, keep this in mind, the limit is 20 lakhs. So there is also a composition scheme, a scheme known as composition scheme. This is a simplified scheme. What is it? You, you deviate from your regular scheme of taxation. You pay tax GST at some X percentage and then file the returns. That's all. There is no need for any adjustments on ITC. There is no need for any complicated uh, uh, filing of GST of one, etc. etc. So a composition scheme is a simplified scheme meant for small businesses. And it is applicable only up to a turnover of 1.5 crores. And in GST, GSTN is uh, uh, allotted. The moment you register, the government gives you the GST number. So it's a 15-digit number. And in the, on the screen also, the, the composition of this number is mentioned. You can uh, uh, just look at it. Uh, what is the 15-digit GST comprises of? And then this GST system also has assessment, enforcement, the scrutiny, and audit would be undertaken by the authority which is collecting the tax. So what happens? When the registered taxpayer or the assessee, every month what they do, they do the transactions, they assess their tax and they file their returns. And at a later stage, whatever the assessee is filing, based on the risk profile or based on various other parameters, the authorities will undertake assessment, enforcement, scrutiny and audit, whatever is applicable. So, and this information of taxpayer will be shared among the central and state governments for tax So, central government, if they have some information about a taxpayer, so this would be sh shared with the state government and vice versa. So this was not there earlier. For example, when there was a VAT in, under the sales tax laws, the sales tax department did not have any obligation to share the sales data with income tax department, with the central department. But now in GST, everything has changed. So central government can share the data with state government and the state government can also share the data with the central government. This has to be kept in mind and this is also a very important point. So there is another tax called as integrated goods and services tax. This is not a different tax, but this is applicable in case of interstate sales. For example, in India, either I can sell within the state or I can sell outside the state. Is it not? So if I'm if I'm selling outside the state, then I will apply IGST, not CGST and SGST, which I have stated earlier. CGST and SGST applies only when I'm selling inside the state where I am registered. So IGST applies if I am selling outside the state. <clears throat> now, what is, what is IGST? In simple terms, IGST is a simple mathematics. IGST equals to CGST plus SGST. So it is not a separate tax. IGST is the combination of CGST plus IGST. And remember one thing, the moment you are selling outside the state, IGST applies. And if you are selling inside the state, CGST, SGST will apply. <clears throat> so um, when it comes to rate in GST, you might have seen there are so many rates that you are seeing. 5% rate you will see, 12% rate you will see, 18%. 28%, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So, what is this rate? So, we have a four rate structure as of now: 5, 12, 18, and 28. And within these rates, within these schedules, there are schedules for 5%, 12%, 18%, and 28%. The government has moved many items from 28% to 18% or 12% or 5%, etc. etc. Cetera, et cetera. So uh, the stress has been to make maximum goods fall within 12% or 18% and some minimum goods into the 5% and move away from 28% except for some sin and luxury goods. Okay, so the lower rate for necessary items and basic importance, that is the main policy of the GST. So the higher average rate is 12% or 18% and the lower rate for essential items. <clears throat> and for precious metals like diamond, jewelry, 
etcetera and etcetera the special rate applies 1% or 3% and there are exempted items certain items are exempted there is separate notification issued there would be no absolutely gst on that those items for example if i may say the petrol there is no gst on petrol but the government levies other taxes but not gst for example vegetables you sell the vegetables there is no gst on that you sell the milk there is no gst on that so similarly there are so many other items um, which are kept outside the purview of the GST or which are exempted from the GST law. So CGST and SGST rates are agreed by both the governments. And um, for exports, there is something called a zero rating. You might have heard about zero rating. What is zero rating? It is not exemption. There is a difference between exempted items and zero rating. Don't confuse yourself with um, um, these two items as one. Zero rating is different and exempted items are different. So what is zero rating? If you are exporting your services or the goods outside India, then GST will not apply. That is not called as exemption, but that is called as zero rating. Okay. So it has its own implications, but technically, when we are talking about the GST, we should use the technical terms and the technical terms in the case of exports is zero rating and we should not use the term exempted for exports. So whenever you import any good or service, IGST will apply. It is not CGST as GST. Earlier, we used to pay the excise duty or countervailing duty, CVD, when we are importing the items. Now, instead of that, IGST will apply. What is IGST? As I've told, it is CGST and SGST. So I've given the illustration. The slide will also be shared. Maybe Mr. Prakash will share this slide with you. You can go through this structure. So if you are confused as to uh, what is the difference between previous tax, tax structure and the GST tax structure? And uh, is there a real saving between previous tax structure and the current tax structure? You can refer to this example. In this example, as you can see uh, below, um, as I'm pointing out my cursor here, you can see the tax invoice in case of A, previous tax regime, it was VAT was 11 and the price was 121. And in Second example, it was 12.1, the price was 133.1, and the third one is 13.31, and the price was 146.41. Whereas in GST, the CGST and SGST incidence is 20 rupees. So there is a saving of 1 rupee compared to the previous regime. Similar, similarly, in other examples also, there is a saving of um, some 1 rupee or so uh, based on this example. So you can refer to this example to understand the concept of the GST and how it has saved some um, taxes and the burden on the consumers and also the cost to the uh, businesses. Now, those were some of the fundamentals of the GST law. And now moving to the registration aspect, uh, one of the important condition is registration. You might have heard about so many people asking you, do I have to register or when do I have to register? The answer is here. Now, compulsory registration, there are certain instances where a compulsory GST registration has to be taken. And there is a voluntary GST registration also. If someone wants to take GST registration voluntarily for his own reason, although there, it is not compulsory as per the law, but if they want to go for voluntary registration, that is also possible. Okay. So now what is the monetary limit as I have already stated there? Uh, other than northeastern states, 20 lakhs. For outside Telangana, it is 40 lakhs. Northeastern states, 10 lakhs. Outside Telangana, 20 lakhs. Now, the time limit for registration. When do they have to register? 30 days from the date on which the above limit is crossed. Now, for example, uh, if I may give you the example, we are in the month of August. If my turnover in the month of August is, let's say, 18 lakhs or 19 lakhs, and if next month my turnover is going to cross 20 lakhs, so let's say by 31st August, my turnover will cross 20 lakhs. So from 31st August, I have 30 days time. By before 30th September, I have to go for, I have to apply for registration. Okay. So therefore, um, one is the threshold limit and the timeline. Both are important for taking the registration. And once you reach the threshold limit, <clears throat> you have to go and apply for <coughs> registration. I'm sorry. So the above limit does not apply to taxable person having registration under the earlier law. Now, one of the most important point, which I want to point out here, unlike in income tax, you might have heard, 
up to 2.5 lakhs rupees or 3 lakhs rupees there is no tax after 3 lakhs rupees there is a 5% tax over and above 3 lakhs etc and etc this scheme will, will not apply once you are registered once you are registered then even if your turnover is 10 lakhs or 5 lakhs or 1 lakh you have to collect gst and pay the gst so that is the difference between the gst law and the income tax so this limit will apply only up to a state where a person is not registered but once he is registered this limit does not apply even if this, there is one rupee he has to collect and pay the gst so <clears throat> the list of uh, instances where compulsory gst registration is required is uh, displayed on the screen you can say if you are making interstate taxable supply if you are selling from one state to another state then you have to take compulsory gst registration now my friends very important now it says only interstate supply means sales sale from one state to another state then you have to take registration even though 20 lakhs turnover is not there even if your turnover is 5 lakhs and if you are making from sale from one state to another state you have to apply for registration now this this will not apply to the purchases if you are purchasing from another state there is no compulsory registration this will apply to only sales so then there are other uh, uh, cases also you can just take a look at it we don't have much time to really go into this list i am just uh, moving forward but uh, you can uh, refer to this list later also and what is the procedure for registration um the there is a common portal on the common portal online application is prescribed and uh, the intending person who wants to take registration has to gather all the documents which are required for registration and he has to make an online application and once the application is made the department people will ver verify the online application and if they have any queries they will ask you to resubmit the documents along with the application and once you resolve the queries immediately the registration number will be allotted so now we will move on to returns now once registration is done the moment you take the registration your compliance in the gst will start and one of the most important compliance is returns okay so there are other compliances also like for example you have to prepare the tax invoice you have to collect the gst you have to remit the gst etc and etc but amongst them one of the important and uh, regularly um, regular area for work is uh, the returns in the gst law so therefore um, i would take you to some of the basics of the returns so earlier these were the list of returns in the gst law outward supply return which is present now inward supply return this has been withdrawn monthly return this has been summarized so there is a first return which has to be filed after taking the registration annual return is there gst are 9 and 9c and the final return is there when you cancel the registration you have to file one final return so these are the list of returns and uh, there are so various due dates for each return and uh, this was there earlier but now other returns like for example inward supply gst r2 has been withdrawn so it is not relevant now my next slide this slide you can see these are the three returns which are very important and which you have to keep in mind and you may come across these returns these terminologies during regular course of work for example gst r1 what is gst r1 this return has to be filed by the registered person every month gst r1 is outward supplies return and it has to be filed by 11th of the next month for example for the month of august that after 31st august all august related sales i have to report by 11th of september in gst r1 so there is another return gst r 3b it is a summarized monthly return and it has to be filed by 28th of next month uh, first 11th i have to file gst r1 and 20th i have to file 3b and there is another important return gst r 2b this need not be filed by the taxpayer but it is auto generated by the system itself gst r 2b the reason why i have mentioned is you are going to listen or you are going to see the 2b or you are going to um, you will be asked about 2b uh, maybe during your course of work so therefore i mentioned here for your understanding what is 2b 2b is a form it is a auto populated itc generated by the system itself and this form is generated by 13th of the next month 
After 11, this form is generated 2B. So this 2B comprises of all the purchases ITC related data. So therefore, these three forms every month plays an important role in return filing process under the GST law. So if you don't file the return, what happens? There is a late fee, 100 rupees per day, CGST 50 and SGST 50, 50, 50 per day, maximum up to uh, 5,000. And this limit, uh, the government reduces uh, from time to time, 25 rupees plus 25, 50, 50 plus 50. Sometimes this late fee will also be waived during COVID times, the government has waived. One time amnesty also was announced where this late fee is uh, waived, but now the late fee is effective. So if you are if you have taken registration under the GST law and if you don't have any sales, if you don't have any business, even though you have to file the return, you have to file the nil return. If you don't file the nil return, this late fee will attract. Okay, Per day, late fee attracts and it is maximum up to 5,000 rupees for each return for every month. So therefore, it is very important that returns under the GST are filed regularly even though there are no sales transactions. So annual return is there. The limit is now 200 rupees per day, maximum up to 0.25% of turnover in the state or union territory. So now we will go on to the input tax credit. Input tax credit is also a very, very important area under the GST law. In fact, that is the heart of the GST law because the main justification for bringing into the GST law is input tax credit itself. And one of the reasons why we have seen the taxes reduced in the GST is also the input tax credit. So therefore, it is very important for you to understand what is input tax credit under GST law. So <clears throat> what are the eligibilities and conditions under the ITC? So before that, let me just explain you the basics of uh, the input tax credit. What, what is input tax credit for the beginners? Just I'll take one minute. So what happens in ITC when in a business, what happens? A registered person who is doing the business, well, how does he do the business? He purchases something. Let's say he is a trader. He purchases something and he sells those items to third person. He will add his margin and he will sell to the retailers. He will buy from wholesalers and he will sell to uh, the consumers if he is a retailer. So what happens when he is buying the items from the wholesaler, he pays the GST to the wholesaler, is it not? You pay the GST. So what happens to that GST? So whatever the GST, a business pays, a registered person pays, he can take the credit of that GST. Having taken the credit of the GST, what will he do with that credit? He will use that credit for paying the tax on his sales. So what he will do? He will sell the goods. He will collect the GST from the customer. And at the time of making the payment of GST to the government, what he will do? He will use the input tax credit. He has already, pay, already paid the GST to the wholesaler. He will use that credit and pay the remaining tax in cash. So in net effect, by way of claiming ITC, he ends up paying the GST only on his margin, only on his profit. So that is the concept of input tax credit. So there is a whole mechanism the whole scheme of input tax credit that has been uh, embedded into the law itself, uh, how ITC can be taken, how it can be utilized, and uh, how it can be offset, et cetera, et cetera, it has been prescribed in the law itself. So ITC can be claimed only by the registered person. If you are unregistered, for example, you are a normal consumer. If you, you bought something, you went to a restaurant or you went to some supermarket, you paid 10,000 rupees GST, you bought some big television and you paid 10,000 rupees GST. The question is, can you claim the ITC? You cannot claim the ITC because you are a consumer, you are not a registered person. For claiming the ITC, you should be registered into the GST law. <clears throat> so goods are, uh, serv so all those goods which you are purchased, it should be used in the course or furtherance of the business and the amount will be created to Electronic credit ledger. Electronic credit ledger is a ledger maintained in the common portal, all nine. So manner of claiming the credit is prescribed on the screen. IGST can be claimed for both CGST and IGST. And CGST can be claimed for CGST and SGST can be claimed only for SGST. So the person who is taking the credit, 
these are very important my friends he should have a tax invoice with him debit note or any other tax paying document and the tax invoice shall be issued by the registered supplier and he should receive the goods and uh, he should also pay the taxes so capital goods also the itcb can, can be claimed this is one of the biggest benefit in the gst law not only you are trading goods but also the capital goods for example you bought a big machinery for opening your business you have paid a big amount of gst on those capital goods one of the biggest benefit that the gst law bought in is whatever gst you paid for at the time of purchasing those big machinery that big machinery you can take that entire itc and you can use that itc also immediately this is one of the biggest benefit and this benefit was not there into the previous law so now coming to the accounts and records so there is a very uh, dedicated chapter in the gst law on what accounts has to be maintained what books have to be maintained in which manner it has to be maintained and it is very important in the gst law that accounts and records have to be kept properly efficiently and accurately and uh, every registered person has to maintain the books and person who is the operator warehouse or godown although he is not registered he has to maintain the books the transporter who is transporting the goods although he is regi not registered he has to maintain the books and uh, such other class of taxable persons as may be notified so one of the most important point here is a registered person the moment he is registered in the gst law all these obligations will automatically cast on him the moment you register in gst law you should start filing the return you should collect the taxes you should maintain the books etc etc and whoever is having warehouse or go down or whoever is a transporter irrespective of the fact whether he is registered or not they have to maintain the books so where they have to maintain the books not at the place of residence not in the house it has to be maintained in the principal place of business what is principal place of business when you at the time of registration you have to specify what is your place of registration what is your place of business so that place will become the principal place of business and that is the place where you have to keep the books of accounts and if you are registered at more than one place then you have to maintain the books of accounts at all at all those places and a true and correct account of production everything has to be maintained as has been displayed on the scheme the term used is true and correct it is not fair it is not true and fair correct means correct rupee to rupee everything has to be accurate so to that extent the law is stringent on maintaining the books of accounts under the gst law it talks about production or manufacture of goods purchase and sale of goods stocks input tax credit output tax payable etc etc it has to be maintained properly not like previous tax regimes but in gst it has to be maintained in a true and correct manner so the documents which a registered person has to maintain are invoices bills of supplies delivery chalans credit notes debit notes receipt vouchers etc etc all these records have to be maintained now these records can also be maintained in the digital form it is not necessary that you have to keep a big pile of files with all the copies of these invoices and bills of supply even the digital copy digital version is fine so period of retention of goods 72 months up to 72 months it has to be uh, kept for example uh, books of accounts related to financial year 1718 when the gst started it has to be maintained up to 31st december 2020 24 so as i have said it could be in the hard copy format or it could be in the electronic format also it is not necessary that it should be in the hard copy format but there are there are certain instances where the hard copy is mandatory but in practical implementation even if you can have the soft copy if you can justify the transaction showcase them with a soft copy so that will uh, also resolve the matter so there is an annual audit under the gst law so every registered person has to uh, do the audit and it is based on the turnover now the turnover is more than 2 crores up to 2 crores there is no annual audit after 2 crores there is a annual audit exceeds prescribed limit etc etc now this uh, annual audit has been uh, uh, removed uh, with effect from 2021 22 
So there was GSTR 9 and 9C. 9 was annual return and GSTR 9C for annual audit. Now, instead of annual audit, certification by the child accountant, a self-certification by the registered person itself will suffice. But prior to 2021-22, the annual audit and uh, certification was uh, certification by a child accountant was mandatory. So there are other uh, provisions also, which I will not go into that. They are much deeper uh, into the GST law. So I will, I will just skip it but you can refer it whenever this uh, PPT is shared with you. Now, what I will do, I will uh, share with you, I will start my another PPT on latest updates in the GST law, which is which is the emerging trends, uh, what is going on. I will try to dwell on important topics for those people who are already into the GST, who have uh, who are not aware about what is going on to the GST. My second phase will help you. I'm just opening the second slide now. You see, these are the contents, but don't worry. I will, uh, we have another 15 minutes or so. Uh, I will try to wrap it up uh, within 15 minutes. I will just explain you what is going on with so many, uh, going on on so many other developments in the GST law. One is the levy, the charging section under the GST law. Um, you see, I have, uh, I have already told whenever there is a supply of goods or supply of services, the GST levy will attract. Now, what has happened? There is a recent change in case of clubs and associations. And this is one of the fundamental principle of the tax law itself that you cannot supply or you cannot supply or you cannot provide the services to yourself. For example, clubs and associations, what they will do? Clubs and associations, there are members into the club and there is a club, is it not? So clubs and members, they are one and the same. If I become a member of the club, so I contribute some amount and I benefit from that amount. There is no third party who is providing services here. So members, they are contributing to the club from their pockets and they are benefiting from that funds. So that is not a service by one person to another person, but that is service by oneself. So now what has happened? There is an important development into the GST law. So there was a Supreme Court judgment in uh, Calcutta Club. Um, so in back in 2000, uh, uh, 2021, so which says there is no service tax on uh, members of the club because it is a self-service. It is not a service provided by one person to another person. Now, what has happened is in Finance Act 2021, so the amendment was brought in to nullify the effect of the judgment where even if the services are supplied by, even if the services are supplied by the member of the club to the club, then the GST will apply. So this is one of the latest development in the GST law, nullifying this uh, judgment. GST will apply when a club is supplying services to the member. So earlier, by virtue of the Supreme Court, the service tax was not applicable, but in GST, the GST applies. Uh, restaurant services, very important, my friends. So many developments have happened in restaurant services also. If you are working on restaurants, like for example, Swiggy, Zomato, etc., etc. The important change has happened. From 1st January 2022, from 1st January 2022, an important amendment has come. As per this amendment, if a restaurant is selling the food to a customer through Swiggy or Zomato, then in that case, the tax has to be paid by Swiggy and Zomato. Prior to January 2022, the restaurant was supposed to collect the tax and pay the tax. But now with effect from January 2022, the collection payment of tax, the levy of tax is not on restaurant, but on Zomato and Swiggy. So in short, what I'm trying to tell you from 1st January 2022, whatever food that you are ordering on Swiggy and Zomato, the Swiggy and Zomato has to pay and not that uh, the restaurant from where the food is being ordered. So in case of registrations, as I've told uh, in my introductory para itself, the threshold limit is uh, uh, 20 lakhs in Telangana and 40 lakhs in uh, other states. This has already been discussed. 
because uh, originally the threshold limit was 20 lakhs and later uh, the limit was increased to 40 lakhs so from 1st april 2019 the limit was increased from 20 lakhs to 40 lakhs but in case of telangana the limit is still 20 lakhs so now in case of cancellation this is very important and there is something called as uh, um, you know the the tax policy there is a cross compliance tool embedded in the tax tax policy so what is this cross compliance tool if you don't do this then something else will happen if you don't do this then your registration will be cancelled if you don't do this then this this will be this will happen so there is something called as a cross compliance like for doing this compliance for doing this compliance you will be asked to forego some other uh, facility so some other benefit that that is being availed into the gst law for example now you are having a GST registration. Now, if you don't file the monthly return for a continuous period of six months or three consecutive periods respectively, then the registration will be cancelled. It is subject to cancellation. And if you are issuing the invoice or bill without supply of goods or services, registration would be cancelled. Availing input tax credit in violation of provisions of 16 of the Act, registration will be cancelled. So, there are a list of defaults which are displayed on the screen. The moment these defaults are achieved, there is a possibility that the registration will be cancelled. Then now what happens, friends, if the registration is cancelled, the moment registration is cancelled, your business with will come to stand still. You cannot issue the tax invoice. A person is not allowed to collect the GST without registration. He cannot collect the GST. So th therefore, what happens? And he cannot sell also. He is not allowed to sell the goods and uh, unless he is registered. Otherwise, it will attract a great penalty, huge penalty. So, therefore, registration is very important. So, the most important point that you have to remember here is the return filing is very important to the GST law and non-furnishing of the returns for a continuous period of six months or three consecutive periods respectively will attract cancellation of registration. If someone has taken the registration and if he, is, if he has forgotten to file the returns, remember, it is possible that online the registration would be cancelled. So, there is a procedure for revocation also that has been given. I won't go into that. And there is something called a suspension of registration. This, are, this was introduced uh, uh, recently in, uh, uh, in 2018 Finance Act and uh, it was made effective from Fe February 2019. So, uh, when GST was uh, launched, this suspension provision was not there, but it was introduced in the middle. So, what is registration or suspension? Suspension is <clears throat> a status between the registration and the can ultimate cancellation. When a registration is suspended, the registered person is not required to file the return while registration remains active pending cancellation. So, there are certain um, other compliances that a registered person has to fulfill while the registration is under process. But one thing you have to remember, the suspension is different and cancellation is uh, uh, different. So, okay, suspension does not mean the registration has been cancelled, but after the registration is suspended, the registered person cannot supply the taxable goods, but he can continue the normal business activity without raising a tax invoice or collecting the taxes. So, there is another important point, my friends, you have to remember. Aadhaar authentication has been uh, given a full force into the GST law now, while taking registration also. One has to undergo the Aadhaar on the authentication. If Aadhaar authentication is not undertaken, then the officer will visit to your uh, place of business for verification. If Aadhaar authentication is done, no physical verification will be done. So, the, some of the changes in invoices and debit notes, these are very, very important. And now, e-invoicing has come. You might have heard about e-invoicing. So, let me just tell you what is e-invoicing. E-invoicing is electronic invoicing. You might have... Uh, uh, seen or done invoicing manually, is it not? You can do the invoicing in Tally software, you can do the invoicing in SAP, you can do the invoicing in Oracle, etc. and etc. Any application. Is it not? So, in while preparing the invoice, what you will do? You will give the customer uh, details, uh, item, etc. and etc. And then the invoice, will, you will print the invoice and then you will stamp the invoice, sign the invoice and then, then you will email the invoice. Whereas the e-invoicing, what happens? Invoice number, the moment you give the basic details of invoice, 
For example, if you give the details of your customer, his registration number and the item which you are selling, the value, all these key components, the moment you feed into the system, then what system will do? It will transfer all these details to the government portal. From government portal, the serial number of invoice, which is known as IRN will be generated. That IRN will be given to the registered person, that IRN will be printed on the invoice and invoice is printed. So automatically, e-invoice is printed in the system itself. So what a registered person has to do, he has to only give certain basic details, basic details of what he is selling and to whom he is selling. So invoice number is also given automatically by the government system. And moreover, my friends, this, the details which you are feeding into the system, these details are automatically transferred to the GST portal itself. In GST or one monthly return, the sales will be automatically reflected. So now what is the limit? The important thing is limit. Now, the e-invoicing limit is now, as of now, it is 20 crores, but it has been further reduced to 10 crores from October 2022. From October 2022, whoever is having 10 crores turnover, they have to generate e-invoice only. They cannot generate normal invoice, manual invoice. So below 10 crores, yes. Above 10 crores, 100% e-invoice has to be generated. Debit notes, my friends, just one minute I will take. Debit notes, important thing has happened. Uh, people who know about these debit notes, once you make the sales, once you show the tax invoice, if you if you have under, underpaid the tax, if you want to charge more tax, then debit note is issued into the GST. Now, earlier the debit notes was linked to the tax invoice. Now, from January 2021, these debit notes are delinked from the tax invoice. I mean, there is no correlation with, between debit notes and the tax invoice. You can issue, the, issue them independently. Earlier, there was, a li there was a linking. Without giving invoice number, you are not allowed to generate the debit notes. But now, even if you don't have the original invoice number, you can generate the debit notes. Now, input tax updates on input tax credits and reversals. So, some of the important updates have come. Now, for taking the input tax credit, the supplier, the person from whom you have purchased the goods, he has to file the GSTR1. Unless the supplier files the GSTR1, the recipient cannot take the ITC. This was not there earlier, but now it has come. Second thing is, all the ITC has to be communicated through GSTR2B. I have mentioned in the return section what is GSTR2B. Now, as per uh, the latest update, the, all the detail, all the purchases which was made, it has to be reflected in 2B. Unless it is the it is reflected in 2B, you cannot take the ITC. This is very very important. You should keep this in mind. ITC can be taken only on those items which are reflected in 2B, GSTR2B. And when it will reflect in GSTR2B, it will be reflected only when the supplier files GSTR1. <clears throat> and this is also very, very important. The time limit have for it, availing the ITC has been, has been extended from September to November. November has not been notified yet. It is yet to be notified. But uh, earlier it was September. Now for financial year 2022-23, my last date for taking the ITC as of today is September. It has been amended to November, but not notified yet. Maybe it may be notified, but it is notified. I can take the credit for last year maximum by November. I will skip some of the updates on ITC and uh, blocking of unblocking of ITC. This is one of the important update. Now, if there are certain violations under the GST law, then the officer will have the power to block the ITC. So what will happen if the ITC is blocked? If the ITC is blocked, my friends, then the registered person has to pay the tax from his pocket. It has a big implication. <clears throat> so, I am skipping some of the items uh, uh, which may not be relevant. So, as I said earlier, late fee waiver scheme was launched to waive the late fee in respect of pending GSTR1. Uh, the scheme waived late fee up to August 2. After August 2021, there is no late fee waiver scheme. So, there is an annual return I mentioned earlier also. Um, 
the CA certification in 9C has been discontinued. A new self-certification has to be done by the registered person. 9 and 9C has to be uh, done and there is no, no change in the format also. So that uh, limit is 2 crores for filing the annual returns. So e-way bills, my friend, what is e-way bill? Uh, just to tell you uh, some fundamentals about e-way bills, whenever someone is moving the goods, he has to generate the tax invoice. And in addition to that, he has to generate the e-way bill on the online, on the common portal. So goods have to be accompanied with tax invoice and e-way bill. If e-way bill is not there, then the vehicle and goods will be detained. Some changes have happened. Like for example, um, no physical e-way bill. If an e-way bill is based on e-invoice, instead of physical copy of invoice, there is no need to carry the physical e-way bill also. <clears throat> so another important thing on refunds, Aadhaar authentication is now mandatory for key management persons of entity as a precondition for submitting the RFD01 applica refund application form. Officers and penalties also, there are some important updates have come, but I am skipping now. That is outside the scope of the for, for uh, uh, topic today. So show cause notices also, I'm not going into it now. Appeals, uh, my friends, still GST tribunal has not been constituted. So the appeals, if any, in the GST law are uh, can be filed only up to commissioner appeals. And after that, uh, one has to go to the high court. So that's all from my side today. Uh, thank you so much. And now the floor is open. If you have any question and answers, you can uh, um, pose your questions and I will try to answer you to your questions. Yeah. Uh, thank you. All the participants, uh, you, you can unmute the mic and talk, the person by person, OK? Not all of you at a time, one by one. Sir, I have a question. Can I ask? Yeah, yeah. Sure, madam. Go ahead. Sir, I am Sirisha from Hyderabad. Sir, yeah. I have a concern regarding the small scale industries like uh, ladies, they'll do small business at home or uh, uh, in a small area. Even they have, they'll be covered under the GST. Suppose I start a work of distribution from my home. Need not be, madam. I, I got your point. You see, I've mentioned in my first PPT, the threshold limit is 20 lakhs. Mm. In Telangana, the threshold limit is 20 lakhs. It, it is calculated on annual basis. And okay. your financial year starts from 1st April 2022. From 1st April 22, 2022, you should start calculating your annual turnover. Okay. But uh, now, once one they, thing. Sorry to interrupt, sir. Once they start, it's not it like a turnover. We can't estimate, no, sir. They start small. Fair enough. Fair enough, madam. For example, if you are about to reach your turnover to 20 lakhs. Okay. Okay. So the law has given you the, the, the time of 30 days for a making application. Okay. The moment you reach 20 lakhs, then you have 30 days time limit to take the registration. It is not but, that 29.5 lakhs you have reached and then you have to take the registration. It's not like that. You reach okay. to 20 lakhs. After 20 lakhs, within 30 days, you take registration. Oh. And when we are registering for GST, is it like it is for central or state, sir? Suppose I start my registration in state level, like Hyderabad. I, one second, madam. See, as I've already told you, the GST is administered both by the central and state governments together. Okay. So there is a common portal. You, when you apply for registration in the common portal, mm. the registration number is granted. And mm. in the registration itself, your office will be allocated. It could be either center or state. But whoever administers, he will administer for state also. If a, if a state is granted, he will administer for center also. But we are collecting for center, though we are registered in the state level. They are collecting for center, CGST and SGST in everywhere. I am so, telling you, no, madam. That, 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 that is the reason I am telling you. You will collect both CGST and SGST and the authority who is, who is uh, who, under whose registration your registration is calling, he will administer both for center and state. Okay, sir. Thank you. Previously also, actually, the sales tax officer, he was collecting it and then that was shared by this, the center. Same thing. Oh. Oh. Yes. Anyone? 
Okay. So now we close the session. Thank you one and all. And then we should uh, actually, it was a very professional, practical lecture on this GST. He covered many topics and he was anxious to see that our students are exposed to all practical aspects of entire GST. It was not only that uh, updates and he, he gave a sort of a overview on GST. Sir, we are thankful to you. I request all the participants unmute the mics and then please give him a big hand. Let us all thank him thank for a wonderful lecture. All of you, all of you. Okay. Sir, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you so much. Nice. Thank you, sir.